Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our mask ultrasound Zoom meeting. And I would like to welcome our participants. And especially, I would like to especially welcome our speaker, Dr. Sean Mulvaney. I would like to give an introduction before he speaks. Uh, Dr. Sean Mulvaney is an associate professor of medicine at the Uniform Services University in Bethesda, Maryland and is board certified in sports medicine and pain medicine. During his entire 31 year military career, he served the nation's special operations community as both a Navy SEAL officer for nine years. Can you imagine that nine years as Navy SEAL officer and an army physician in special operations for 22 years? He was the first Department of Defense physician to be credentialed in platelet-rich plasma and stem cell therapy for repair of musculoskeletal and spine injuries starting in 2008. I would say he's the top authority in the world right now on the use of stellate ganglion block to treat post-traumatic stress disorder and has eight peer-reviewed papers on this topic. He has an international reputation as an educator of other physicians and pioneered and published on ultrasound guided techniques. His practice is regenerative orthopedics and sports medicine. He's focused on the repair of musculoskeletal, nerve and spine injuries using regenerative medicine techniques with ultrasound and fluoroscopic guidance. Tonight, ladies and gentlemen, I'm honored to introduce to you a friend and a colleague, Dr. Sean Mulvaney. Dr. Sean Mulvaney, welcome to our mass called us on Zoom. Before we begin, before I turn over to him, let's just pause for a moment for a short uh, prayer. Let's pray. Our gracious, loving Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity that we can come together to learn new things and especially this breakthrough treatment on a post-traumatic stress disorder uh, through steroid ganglion block. We would like, Lord, to thank you for your grace and we would like to ask for your Holy Spirit to be with us and give us a special guidance and uh, wisdom as uh, Dr. Shan will present his uh, uh, topic tonight. Can you give him wisdom tonight? Help us all get to experience your presence. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So Dr. Shan Moveni, welcome. Now it's all yours. Okay, first off, thank you so much for the invitation to talk to you guys. I think it's with technology, it's amazing that, you know, we can all be together and, and here it is, we're talking, there's no delay. I think this is just incredible. I, I'm still impressed by it. Um, the topic today is one that uh, you, when you think of celiac ganglion block to treat post-traumatic stress injury is one that maybe doesn't fall into the scope of your practice. And I completely relate because it did not fall into the scope of my practice. It was nothing that I even was, in, I was not interested in behavioral health or getting involved in this. I really got involved in this um, because of an unfilled need and because that the current treatments, I saw so many people um, really suffering and I, not just the person, but it impacts their families, it impacts their spouses and their children. So then it becomes the pain of the, the original trauma becomes now generational and we have a chance to actually intervene. And if the interventions were working well, I would not be here talking about this topic. We'd be talking about something else like stem cells into the disc or whatever, but there's so many other things. But this is so pervasive and it's, it's in your patient population. It's, it's in the people around you because it, it is so very common. And now, I mean, I, I did most of my papers treating um, combat-related uh, post-traumatic stress injury, but now I'm treating victims of human trafficking. I'm treating of like the, the Las Vegas mass shooting um, of terrible fires and tra taking care of the firefighters. Uh, sexual assault is, is just um, unfortunately so, so common. Child abuse, so, so common. Um, and just civilian trauma, just uh, it's it is um, it is so sad, but it is all around us, and it is in the patients that you're treating now every day. And many of them, they just don't bring it up. They just it's not something that we talk about. And really, on a scientific scale, like if somebody says post traumatic stress disorder, 
my own eyes roll. Like you're just kind of bored of it. It's like, okay. So when you, but I had these people that had, they failed multiple inpatient treatments, multiple outpatient treatments. They'd be on one, two, three, four psychoactive medications and still in a terrible place. Um, the scoring that we use for this when we, you know, we can actually quantify their symptoms based on validated instruments, which I'll go into. Um, but you'd see when people have very high uh, anxiety scores associated post-traumatic stress injury, they're thinking of killing themselves. You don't even have to ask. Once they get to a certain point, they're, they're, they can't stay there. They can't stay in that place that they're at. And they're actively thinking of taking their lives. And, and we see this um, frequently. So that's a long way of saying, I think this topic is important. And I understand if you don't think it falls into your current practice, but just stay with me and let me kind of get you to what we're talking about. And because many of you here have the skills to do this procedure, you may need some more training. Uh, you may need um, some more guidance uh, as you get going, but it is the most worthwhile part of my practice now. And unlike all the things that we do, where like we inject and we're like, well, see you in you know, eight to 10 weeks and see how you're doing. This is one where the flash to bang is right there. Like you, you treat them and they're doing better. And you're, you've already, by the time they leave your clinic, you've started this upward spiral in their life where they can now sleep better and repair the relationships around them and, and dramatically change their lives. And I have, uh, the patients are very appreciative. Their spouses and families are very appreciative. And you really, it's rare that we have a chance to really impact lives and families like that for good. And it's just a, all in all, it's a good thing. So let me see if I can, now that I'm sharing my screen, ah, here we go. Post-traumatic stress injury, uh, well, post-traumatic stress disorder is what we hear it, but really I prefer post-traumatic stress injury. Why is that? Because that changes the optic of how you look at this. If you look at it like an injury, and I look at it like an injury, then it's something that I expect my patients to get over. We expect people to get better from injuries. So this is something where I expect them to get well. And I change it, not like a disorder they're going to keep forever. It's an injury that we just have to treat. And actually, it's very useful because what I do is I tell them, this is like if I'm looking at an x-ray. Like you came into my emergency room, and you had a broken leg, and I looked at the x-ray. And I don't care if you've got it slipping and falling on a sidewalk or falling 30 feet out of a helicopter. It's a broken leg and I can see it and so I should treat it. And why is that little anecdote important? Because you have to get them around to the optic of seeing it as an injury because what happens with post-traumatic stress injury is they feel tremendous guilt. The guilt is pervasive and it's preventing them from getting better. They feel guilty because they can't just get over it and they feel guilty because of how they behave and how they've treated their families. And I use the, take that anecdote and continue it on where I'm like, hey, would you feel guilty if you just couldn't get over your broken leg? And this is ludicrous. Of course you wouldn't feel guilty. Would you feel guilty if you couldn't run on a broken leg? Of course not. So when they see that it's, they come around to my optic, that this is an injury that needs to be treated, and that until it's treated, you're not going to be normal. You're not going to be able to run. Uh, and I let them know, I tell them, you have, this guilt you're having is not something you have to forgive yourself for. This guilt you're having is something that is misplaced and you have to let it go. You have to come around to my point of view. Now, this sounds like a small point that sounds like you're wandering into being a behavioral health counselor. But if you want your patients to get better, there are a couple of key awarenesses that you have to give them. And that's one of them because this guilt is holding them back from repairing themselves. We're designed to switch smoothly back and forth from fight or flight sympathetic to parasympathetic. This is evidenced by, we, we see this when we look at like Animal Planet or something, and we see the lioness chasing the gazelle, the gazelle literally running for its life, and then the lioness gives up the chase, and the gazelle goes back to grazing with the lion still in the frame. It's just right there, but the gazelle's like, look, I have to get back to the business of living. I have to get back to eating and digesting just to survive. So right now, I'm not about to be eaten, so I'm going to start grazing. And we are, we share that autonomic nervous system where we're designed to go back and forth between fight or flight and feed and breed. Now, say we're walking together and we're in Alaska and on vacation, 
And as we're walking, a grizzly bear charges across the stream at us and chases us. If we survive, we'll never forget that moment because be, because we have another system, um, negative bias. This negative bias uh, takes life-threatening or perceived life-threatening situations and imprints them in a way that is a very unusual. It's not a memory at all. It's something unique. It's a memory without a timestamp. It's this entire packet of memory. We hear the, the sound of the grizzlies breathing. We hear the, we have the smells of the forest and the water. We know what time of year it was. We know the angle of the sun. All these things are stored and seared, not as a memory, but as a now. It has no timestamp. So when this is being, when this comes back, you hear the term flashback or as a nightmare, it's not something that to you, it's not to the person that's having it, it's not something that happened a while ago, it's just as terrifying as that moment. And so you have these, these, this input that's affecting body and brain. And what happens is it sets up a situation where you have something like the blue screen of death on a computer where the computer is locked in a bad loop, where the, the, the fight or flight nervous system becomes stuck in the opposition in the conversation between body and brain, and it can't get out of that loop. You can't code your way through the blue screen of death, and until you unplug that computer and plug it back in, it's not going to get better. You don't throw out a computer with the blue screen of death, you just reset it, because there's nothing wrong with the hardware or software. This sounds like too simple of a uh, analogy, but it's what we see happening in post-traumatic stress injury where that fight or flight nervous system is stuck in the on position and we can reboot it. And how do we do that? We go to the cervical sympathetic chain and that's where the conversation between the elements of really the central autonomic network <clears throat> that control our fight or flight nervous system. Uh, the ones that you hear um, bandied about a lot are the amygdala, which is very interesting. People call it a fear center. It's not, it's a monitoring center. It's always monitoring for is some, is it takes in all your sensory inputs, they all go through the amygdala, and the only thing it says is, is this gonna kill me? Is this gonna kill me? And it's doing that in the background all day, every day. Do I smell smoke? Is that dangerous? Do I feel vibrations? What's going on? And if once it makes a determination that it is or is not dangerous, then it goes from there. But also you have insular cortex, prefrontal drives, there's lots of things that make up the central autonomic network. And the central autonomic network com communicates to the body through the cervical sympathetic chain. Now it's not as simple as that, which we'll go into, because some of that sympathetic chain, some of that sympathetic input is also traveling with the, we're finding it travels with the vagus. Those, these symptoms aren't pure sympathetic or parasympathetic, they're dirty, they have, they have overlap. And then this input going down from the, through the superior cervical ganglion, down to the middle ganglion, um, in the cervical sympathetic chain, which you can see here, this is outlined, is that this sympathetic chain actually jacks into the, bra the really the brachial plexus. It jacks into your entire peripheral nervous system, and those sympathetic inputs travel along with the peripheral nerves. And what is the end organ target? So you think like, and for this, what I want you to conjure is you're driving, and it's raining hard, and the car in front, and it's night, and the car in front of you slams on their brakes. And you realize now, as you slam on the brakes, that you're hydroplaning and you're about to slam into that car. What do you experience physiologically? You feel this whoosh. It's not, uh, it doesn't take two minutes of circulation of catecholamines. It happens instantly. You feel this whoosh. Um, that, that feeling like uh, maybe if you've ever lost one of your young children in a crowd, whoosh. You're all of a sudden, you're 100% amped. And that doesn't happen through the circulation of catecholamines, which would be released from the adrenal glands and circulate through the body, it'd take minutes. This is happening through your sympathetic nervous system jacking into your peripheral nervous system. And what is the end organ? What is it affecting? It turns out the end organ is really pericytes, pericytes surrounding all of your blood vessels and all of your organs and all of your perineural circulation, vascular circulation. Now, some of the things it does is obvious. It's going to these parasites are going to constrict in the splanchnic circulation. They're going to uh, relax or dilate in your, in your um, skeletal muscle to help you run and fight, um, and along with a, a myriad of responses. But it's through this channel that is communicating on a cellular level throughout your body. 
Now, everyone thinks that the brain is in charge. The brain is only probably the senior voting member because you have neural tissue throughout your body that's also, because these cervical sympathetics are afferent and efferent. There's communication going to and from and a, and a conversation between the body and the brain. Now, in that conversation, when the brain, if you sit there and you clench both fists and you do nothing more, you're feeling fine, you're sitting here watching a lecture and you clench both fists. If you do that long enough, you become amped, you become agitated. And at the same time, when you can go into to get a massage or something and someone can start rubbing your hands and opening your hands and you will relax and calm down. This conversation is, is, is real on a cellular level and it's happening through the cervical sympathetic chain. And when we go in and place a bolus of long acting anesthetic there, what we see is we turn off that conversation. And when we turn off the conversation between body and brain, the two way conversation, all of those neurotransmitters can re baseline to their standard, their, to their baseline levels. They won't be, um, they won't be out of sorts. They won't be uh, too amped. We see this happening on PET scans. Um, we see this happening on, on functional MRI, but these are very imperfect systems to try to look at the brain. Um, but we still see those parts of the central autonomic network coming down. And I've done some pilot studies uh, with uh, the National Institutes of Health looking at microassays of catecholamines both before and after a stellate ganglion block. And it doesn't appear that the catecholamine levels are changed at all or have anything to do with, um, with what happens with stellate. So with a stellate ganglion block, you're taking a bowl. I use ropivacaine, uh, which is a long acting anesthetic sold under the trade name Naropin in this country. I use 0.5% strength. Um, some people will use Marcaine because it's cheaper, but Marcaine is more cardiotoxic. So in the advent of inadvertent uh, intravascular injection, it potentially is, is more toxic. Uh, and so I've chosen ropivacaine basically for its, its safety. I do these ultrasound guided and I found, and although I, I learned how to do them fluoroscopically guided, overwhelmingly I prefer, uh, I, I think I only did, um, by the time I did fluoroscopic guidance, I had already done hundreds under ultrasound guidance. So when I learned the fluoroscopic guided method, I saw it was more painful my blocks didn't result in as strong of a Horner syndrome. Uh, it was much more kind of scary for the patient. So I abandoned it completely because I had such safety, efficacy, and, and patient comfort with ultrasound. This is just a little, um, a little view. I'll go over the, the parts of the view, just a needle going in place into longus coli at the C6 level. This is the transverse view. Um, and then we'll go over, I'll go over the anatomy in a bit. But what we're looking, uh, once we do a successful block, what we see is a Horner's syndrome. So Horner's is a constellation of, of symptoms where you have, if you look at the, the in this case, the, the right eye, the eye on the left-hand side, left side of the screen is, has scleral icterus, it has meiosis compared to the other eye, and the eyelid is drooping, it has ptosis. Uh, they also will get nasal congestion on the same side as the block was performed. Um, they also say anhydrosis, but that's a difficult one to measure. I actually published a grading scale on um, grading Horners. And the reason why I published a grading scale, an objective grading scale done by somebody other than the person that did the block, is because when I was working at Walter Reed Hospital, or a big, the biggest military hospital in the U.S., I would see doctors do these blocks and then they would say, oh, yeah, that's a good block. And I would be like, their eye isn't droopy. No, it's a good block. They have no pupil changes. No, no, it's a good block. I'm like, their eye isn't red. No, no, it's a good block. And I'm like, what are you talking about? There's no sign of a horner here. Why are you saying it's a good block? So I knew that I needed to publish a scale, an objective scale. And the scale that we use is very, it's a very simple scale. Uh, we only use objective findings. So like something like nasal congestion, we couldn't do because we'd have to ask, are you having nasal congestion on that side? But I just have um, my medical assistant or another physician that's working with me, they sit the patient down and they look at pupil size. Is there an obvious difference in pupil size? If it's obvious, they get two points. If you have to look and say, yeah, there is a difference. It's not that much of a difference, but I can see it. That's one point. If you look and say, hey, I really don't see a difference. That's zero. So um, an obvious meiosis would be two points. And then same thing, same scoring pattern for uh, both ptosis, is it obvious? Two. And then scleral icterus. Now, some people won't respond with scleral icterus right away. I score my blocks five minutes after the block. 
Why is that? Because if it's not a good block at five minutes, it's, I don't think it's going to be a good enough block to get the effects that we want in the, in the uh, central autonomic network. What they feel is they feel almost within, within 10 minutes, this immediate and profound relief. If they came in there with post-traumatic stress injury and they had significant symptoms, this feeling is going to be very dramatic. And I always ask about two things. I ask about symptoms in the brain. Do you feel calm? Yes, I feel calm. And I ask about symptoms. Where do you keep your tension in the body? Uh, a lot of people keep it in the shoulders and neck or in chest, like they can't get a deep breath or in their abdomen. And you can see they have like almost a rigid abdomen, uh, some people, uh, where they can't take in a, an abdominal breath. And so I always ask about how the brain is and then how the body is. Because we're looking to see, hey, did we, did that communication change to resulting in baselining? And when they feel that, I give them a little, another awareness, number two. And I say, have you ever worn a heavy backpack? How do you feel right when you take that backpack off? And they say, oh, I, felt, I feel light. I feel great when I take off the backpack. I'm like, okay, what was in the backpack that made you feel great? And they're like, huh? I'm like, you're right. There's nothing in the backpack that make you feel great. What felt great was the absence of the weight. So it's not the backpack, it's the absence of the weight. I go, I just injected a long-acting anesthetic into your neck. It's nothing that makes you feel good. All it does is make a numb stop. No, nobody steals it. It's not a drug of abuse. It just stops the saltatory conduction of nerves. That's it. But when you use it to turn off that chronic anxiety, then you get this profound relief. So that, and I say what you're feeling is the difference between you being amped, you being burdened with this silverback gorilla-sized amount of anxiety on your back. And we just took that anxiety off. And you're, what you're doing is you're, you're free falling. You're, you're, you're falling down to your baseline levels. And that is actually a, a pretty profound awareness for them that, hey, that's, that's what I'm feeling, huh? I'm, I'm actually feeling back to normal. And then for some people, though, we'll get an emotional response to that because they feel like they're, they were just these lost souls, like they're never going to be better. And so it can be quite profound. And, and I witness that daily. Um, some of the soldiers that I take care of were worried, uh, is this going to make me cry more than usual in, when I watch romantic comedies with my wife? Or, you know, they're, they were worried that they wouldn't be the, the, the soldier that they wanted to be. <clears throat> and I reassured them. I'm like, look, this is, you have, number one, you have two sympathetic chains on both sides of your body. I go, you still have a fight or flight response available to you, even right now. Um, but then all this is out of your system all the anesthetic is out of your system within, you know, 12 hours, 14 hours, something like that. It's gone past its useful half-life. But they were still like, hey, um, some of the soldiers I treated were like, hey, look, I, Doc, I, I appreciate that. But my fight or flight nervous system might not be optimal, but it's been keeping me alive for a decade of combat. Can you guarantee this isn't going to hurt me? So we actually did and published a study. It's available in a, just a PubMed search. Where what we did is we did eight standard neurocognitive tests, including reaction time, including NBAC, tests of memory, executive function. We did them in these people that had PTSD the day before the block. Then when we did the block, we did it one hour later when they were still, because they will report after a block feeling kind of relaxed or calm or like they had a few drinks. Um, and I was always like, huh, are they actually impaired during that time? And then we tested them again uh, one week later. So what we saw at one week was that they're, they're, we use the PCL5 as a 20-question questionnaire. You can just Google PCL5 and you, you'll get a PDF of it. Uh, it's a validated questionnaire uh, that's lined up with the DSM-5 um, to measure uh, psych psychological symptoms. And we saw dramatic improvements in, in their scores. So their, their PTSD symptoms dramatically improved. And then what I wanted to know was, hey, how did, their, how did these neurocognitive tests do, including reaction time, which you can't fake that test. You can take it again and again and again. You won't learn it. And what we, I thought that what we'd show is no difference, that we didn't hurt them at all. But it's not what we saw. What we saw was statistically significant improvements in reaction time, in memory, in executive function. Across the board, we saw these tests improve. And I was like, I didn't expect that. So even when they're feeling relaxed, calm, high, they're still better. And then if we extrapolate in the medical literature um, to sports data and data on police shooting scores and stuff like that, which you can say is it's the only 
really one of the few procedures that we can do that improves performance, actually. So kind of exciting. And then the other thing I do in my practice, I'm always keeping track of, hey, how are my patients doing? So this is just like a, a look at, uh, at one point, my last 232 patients I've done. Now we're over 1,600 patients. Um, but this is, I look at chunks of patients coming in with a score of, you know, a PCL5 score of 62 and still being, you know, over 40 points lower, you know, I mean, over, you know, 20 points lower, you know, a month out, and then we continue to follow them. And now we're using the system data biologics. We're trying to make that work for tracking these symptoms better. So this got some traction last summer. Uh, it was on a American news show, 60 Minutes. Um, and it was actually a very well done piece produced by Heather Abbott. And then we were on our CBS morning show. And then we were on several other, you know, uh, print, the Wall Street Journal had us on the front page. Joe Rogan is a podcast uh, with over a billion downloads. And actually this is with Dakota Mayer, who was a Medal of Honor recipient in her country, who I've treated uh, several times and has been a, a big proponent of this. But he was on that show and, and was able to, um, it reached a lot more people than I thought it was going to. But really the main thing that we, that kind of got this off the block was out of, out of all the papers that were done, uh, we published the first real level one study in uh, Journal of the American Medical Association um, Psychiatry. Um, and basically this was the title of the, the paper where we were, did a, a randomized control trial, of, you know, saline versus um, a real stellate ganglion block in a well-selected population and we were able to show um, statistically significant uh, with a very good p-value um, improvements in the, the SGB group versus the sham group. And this paper was selected for the JAMA site clinical highlights of 2019. It was a multi-center randomized control trial. It was done in Germany and North Carolina and in Hawaii, uh, hospitals and all of those. <clears throat> it was a right-sided uh, six cervical vertebrae level, excuse me, Injection versus a sham injection, just deep to the sternocleidomastoid. Two to one, still like ending black to sham. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> um, we use the gold standard, which is um, the CAPS interview, which takes about a half hour, delivered by a behavioral health professional, um, which is the gold standard for determining whether some, how someone has PTSD or improvements or worsening of their symptoms. We screened 190, 113 were randomized, and 108 completed. So that randomized to completed ratio is actually very good. And it, we did an injection at uh, paired at one week, and then at two weeks, and then we followed them out to eight weeks. And we looked out that our main improvement was improvement in CAPS. And what we saw was the SGB group improved 12.6 points on the CAPS 5, and the SHAM group improved 6.1 points. These were deemed to be um, very statistically significant. And then <clears throat> these are just looking at mean changes that we saw. And then on the, we also used the PCL5 and it was like the data was actually validating the PCL5. And we saw actually very similar numbers and response scores to the CAPS. So that was actually very uh, pleasing that we saw that. And then pretty close correlation with a, an older test that we used to use the the PCL civilian version, PCLC. So it was a blinded sham procedure controlled randomized study. It was, we had uh, research coordinators on site making sure everything uh, went according to protocol. We had very high power to detect a 10 point difference between the groups, very high completion rate, and we had very few loss to follow up, which if you've ever really run a study, that's the huge thing is, is how good is your data and how much did you lose to follow up very rigorous um, methods, which stood up to, uh, even after we published, we, it still stood up to um, kind of academic attacks from behavioral health professionals, and they weren't able to find flaws in the methodology and diverse study sites. Uh, limitations, we wanted more people, and that's just everybody, every study wants more people. And the problem was we already had enough soldiers that knew it was working well, that they didn't want to be randomized. They just wanted to get the block. Um, we didn't blind the anesthesiologists as to what they were injecting. And that was, I was involved in study design. I did not want people, I wanted them to know what they were injecting. I thought that was an important safety point in case of adverse events. And then, um, we thought it was interesting. You'd think 
that the patients would know whether or not they got a real block or a sham block. But this is something that we actually did really well at. When we did the sham injection, we talked to them and we would talk about their eye changes as if they were having a, um, a Horner syndrome. We'd say, yeah, uh, look at that. There goes the pupil. Yep. And the eye. Yeah, there's the droop. And so, and we thought this would kind of be, I don't know, we were like, well, let's try it. And it ended up people really couldn't tell whether or not they had the real injection or a sham injection, which is kind of crazy. Uh, but it was one of these things where th that's what we had. Um, this is some of the key literature on this stuff. Um, excuse me a moment. And we've, um, and actually one of them is, so this is the study that we had done. I'll talk a little bit about Rob McClay and his colleagues did a small randomized control trial. It was inconclusive. And, and during that study, it was really, Rob McClay is a psychiatrist, number one, but they had their exclusion criteria and their population was horrible. They had, they were doing this on folks with severe TBI. Well, there's a lot of overlap, but you can't help severe TBI with this, um, traumatic brain injury. They were doing it on people that were having their disabilities determined at that time, which if we know from the medical literature that if someone's having like a disability and, and their monetary awards determined, you can't really use them in a study, but they use them. And then when they did the block, they only used five mLs of ropivacaine, which is not the standard. The standard is eight to 10. So I don't know uh, why they chose those parameters, but it was their, their study results showed, although they showed the SGB groups doing better, it was very inconclusive. And then this summer, I just published a study looking at two level blocks. So doing it at C6 and then at the C4 level. And that uh, we were seeing a, a trend towards uh, longer and better improvements. Um, and in 147 patients, we failed to reach statistical significance, but it was very promising. We're gonna do another RCT on it. So we have a level one in a high impact journal. Really, at this point, we have over 700 patients in 20 peer-reviewed uh, journal publications. We can reset the sympathetic nervous system with significant and durable clinical benefits. It's highly accepted by patients. Um, and that is based on, actually, uh, Brian McLean's study. He did a study of 250 patients and looked at patient satisfaction and would they recommend having this. And, and it ended up, it was uh, universally appreciated by patients. People are worried about if you do celiac ganglion blocks well, they're actually very safe. Um, but you have to have training. You, anyone can't just go into the anterior neck. You always have to see needle visualization. Um, this is what I tell folks in, in our country that they need to have celiac ganglion block listed on their medical credentials. You need ACLS skills and equipment and drugs to handle adverse events. You need to be able to actually manage an airway. If you inadvertently do a high spinal, you're going to be breathing for that patient for a while, and you need to do that safely. I've never had a single serious adverse event. I'm very careful, but I have all this equipment ready to go, uh, including having midazolam on the table to break surgery, uh, to break any kind of seizures that might happen. So I'm always ready, but I haven't had this happen. Uh, you have to understand the anatomy and depth and appreciate the anatomic variants. You need to understand um, uh, basically local anesthesia, systemic toxicity and depth, and you have to have flawless needle visualization skills. You can't be an amateur here. You have to be a professional. Your needle visualization has to be perfect. Under fluoroscopic guidance, really, you kind of drive it down to a bony landmark. And it's one of these things where the, it's very imperfect. Allergies, not COVID. Um, so you drive it down and you can't see any of the, any of the blood vessels involved. So here we can see even all of the layers of the needle going through longus capitis into longus coli. We can see the nerves, we can see um, even like the vagus nestled between the carotid and the uh, internal jugular vein. So here we have the anterior tubercle of C6. This is longus coli. This is longus capitis. This is the vagus nerve. And then we have the phrenic nerve that the needle is going right by, which you do have to watch. And sometimes you will get an inadvertent hemidiaphragm uh, block. So if you're doing this on somebody with um, any kind of, you know, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or any kind of 
pulmonary disorder, you really have to, you know, watch them to see, hey, did I just, and I, and I have taken out, you know, through anesthetic kind of leakage out, taken out hemidiaphragm and a healthy person won't even notice it. Uh, but it's just something to note if they report some sense of dyspnea after. These are the layers of longus coli where you have these sympathetic fibers running. So getting the needle into longus coli and into that ventral fascia of longus coli, and then into that kind of gutter between longus capitis and longus coli are where most frequently we see these. There are significant anatomic variations in how this runs. And this is really um, Daniel Moore's book on celiac ganglion block. And just here are just some of <clears throat> his diagrams of how the variations in how this cervical sympathetic chain runs. So really getting that, you really need to appreciate that there is variation. And that's one of the reasons why now by doing a two level block, why we have, why we think we're having much better results. So this is just again, contrasting between, now if somebody is well-trained to do fluoroscopically guided blocks and that's what they can do and that's what they can do to help their patients, <clears throat> then I say, great, fine. I'm, I'm not telling you how to do it by ultrasound guidance and I'm not saying that it's inferior or you're not taking as good a care of your patients. What I do know is it is more painful um, invariably because you can't see the nerves that you're going through and you're also going through vessels and you may be compromising vessels. Um, just kind of, you know, leaving some time for questions. Uh, SGB has proven to help veterans with post-traumatic stress injury. <clears throat> Stellic ganglion block, <clears throat> excuse me, is largely untapped as an effective tool to treat post-traumatic stress injury. And this is uh, Congressman Perry, and a celebrity chef who has happened to be a retired military member who's had the stellic ganglion block. Congressman Perry is trying to push legislation through the CARES Act to make this a, a treatment option available to our veterans. And we have veteran groups come down in buses and we, we treat them all and it changes the impact on their families. Um, this is where I work, uh, Rosam in Annapolis, Maryland, uh, 12 hours away from you guys, 12 hours time change from you guys. But, uh, and now I think if we can figure out how to do some questions, uh, I'm gonna go into stop sharing. Well, Dr. Shan, you just uh, made a very fantastic presentation of your experience on uh, stellar ganglion. I was wondering, I uh, just wanted to clarify, uh, was it rupivacaine or bupivacaine that you were using? I use ropivacaine, R-O, ropivacaine. What's the concentration? I use 0.5%. Ropivacaine. Zero point five percent. Eight eight ml. Or well, uh, if I'm doing a single layer, single level block at C six, about eight mls. Uh, Fifteen percent of people will get a uh, hoarse voice uh, due to inadvertent block of the recurrent laryngeal nerve. So they'll get a hoarse voice or a feeling of a globus sensation in the back of their throat. This is not a mistake. This is not considered an adverse event. Happens about fifteen percent of the time. And it can be distressing to the patient, so I always let them know that this is a possibility before it happens. And it'll wear off, yeah. just like the I eye wears off in a couple hours, this will wear off in a couple hours. Yeah, I was looking at your approach and uh, you were very close to the uh, longus coli. Uh, do you also check, like, uh, because it's very close to the vertebral artery at that area, so. Um, oh, I always, when I'm doing it, it, these, I always track the course of the vertebral artery, and I very frequently um, see, um, I very frequently see uh, vertebral arteries running medial to the anterior tubercle. So you have to identify that because if you put a needle in that vertebral artery, it it will um, make them seize instantly. You won't get even a, a half an ml injected before they start to seize. So you have to. Uh, I always identify the course. I always scan with power Doppler um, and, and tr track specifically track the vertebral artery, but also in that area, there's a lot of times a, a big inferior thyroid artery. Um, right. so all, and then a lot of times you'll get a, a radicular C5 radicular artery that will come up right into that same area. So you just really have to, you have to know your anatomy for sure. That's right. And then, uh, 
when when you move it because the C six is really very very large. It's a very six. It's a very large tubercle. So you, you kind of move, move it up and down because some people would like to do it between C six and seven. Do you do you do you need to move the tubercle out before you insert the needle, or you can see really the C six tubercle as you approach it? No, of course I know just what you're talking about. With most people, I can I can get over the C six anterior tubercle. And it's actually pretty rare that I have to go a little above or a little below. And then usually what I do is I scan with power Doppler and I see whether going a little bit lower or a little bit higher is better vascularly. Okay, you know, I so just look when at, you put the Yeah, yeah so, so when the needle approaches, you can really see this, the anterior tubercle of C6. So it's, it's very visible. Yeah, there, so... Right? I usually try to go right over the top of it because when, you, when you're going over the top of the tubercle, uh, if you've tracked the vertebral artery, the vertebral artery is now shielded by bone. So right. that's an ideal place to go if you can do it. Very, some people, right. you just the, the geometry of, of getting the needle into place becomes too difficult and you have to go a little higher or lower, right. especially very, very thin people where their great vessels are laying right on top of the anterior tubercle. Okay, so uh, when, when, when patients would come to you with uh, PTSD, they're still on medication, right? Many of them, of them are, are and, and the only thing I look for is that they're not on anticoagulation medicine, or if they are, that they have stopped it for a few days. Um, I don't do it on people on anticoagulation medicine. But whatever medicine they're on, you know, they're on, and then I ask them to uh, avoid alcohol after the block, because I want them to get that deep delta wave sleep, which alcohol will prevent. Uh, and then I say, if you're doing better, if your symptoms are doing better, then first I want them to start to taper their benzos, if they're on benzodiazepines, that class of drugs. And then if they're doing, still doing well, then to gradually taper um, under the care of their prescribing physician, their other medications. I see. Which, which side is your favorite, the right or the left? Or should, should there be a preference between the right and the left? Next. Well, all of the studies have been done with a right-sided block. So that's actually a critical point. The way most people are wired is they're wired that it's the right side that holds these traumatic memories. Now, we have a paper that's pre-publication where we, we see that about 4.5% of the population will not respond on the right side, and they'll only respond on the left side. So that's about one in 20 or four and a half percent of the population. But then there's this other group that's hard to define and it may be as high as about 10 to 20% of people who even if they respond well on the right side will respond even better on the left. You haven't and done- so this is something that, and this is pre-publication, but it's that we have a, a couple hundred patients that we looked at this in. And it's something that we're looking to do an RCT on. So you only do it on one side? Not I do. Right. I always start with the right side. Always start with the right side. And then if they don't improve, only then do I go to the left side. Okay. I see. So ideally, you only do one session or there's always a need to well, do the second let's session? Let's talk. This is actually very, very, very important. Um, and this has to be understood. When you're looking down... Um, the, down through the larynx and you see the vocal cords. So you have vocal cords that, you know, like you're, if you're very, if we're intubating and stuff like that. Right. So right. when you paralyze, if you have inadvertent block of the recurrent laryngeal nerve, that vocal cord on that side blocks in the closed position. And if you do the other side and their vocal cord becomes paralyzed, now you have a surgical airway emergency. Right. So you can right. never, never, never on the same day block left and right. Cannot do it. Must not. Because really, the worst thing that can happen is that we hurt people with a stellate ganglion block, and then it loses traction as an effective tool. So you can't do both. I, I do them. I go one day and then the next day. Okay. Uh, there's a question here from uh, our attendee from Australia, Dr. Colin. Uh, introducing to you, Sean. Uh, can, you, can you speak up your question? Uh, maybe it's better for you to 
to, an, to ask your question directly. Dr. Colin, hello, can you hear me? Colin, he's a guy from Australia, he's a radiologist, and he is a radiologist. Okay, yeah, go ahead. I hear go you, ahead. Colin. Go ahead. Oh, sorry about that, mate. I, I'm not very good with, uh, with Zoom, unfortunately. So apologies, but great. But you're great, you're great really talk. good at staying really still, though, because you're like not even moving. When you're <laughs> let Let me put the video on. I'm I'm sorry. Let me just uh, do that. Um, look, I just want to ask a bit about um, the um, placement uh, of the um, um, <clears throat> of the the needle tip. Um, so how how we do it um, is um, we we place a needle tip between the vertebral artery and the C seven process. Uh, on CT, on the neck of the first street facing the T1 with the artery. Um, I've recently tried to change to ultrasound guided approach um, with CT confirmation, but we tend to do it on CT only because uh, it, it's, um, you know, we, we can see all the structures, I guess, uh, uh, you know, uh, fairly clearly. Uh, although on ultrasound you can as well, um, but uh, here in Australia we tend to do more things under CT. So it's interesting to see your approach. What what are your thoughts about that approach that we use? Because it's, it's a little bit different from yours, isn't it? I guess this is like different. Yeah, Colin, you're not going to like my answer at all, I'm afraid, um, because I think CT guidance is actually uh, it's not indicated at all. And I think CT guidance should only be used when you can't use uh, when you don't subject the patient to so much ionizing radiation with with ultrasound, and especially oh. it being at the thyroid level. I think the levels of ionizing radiation, any levels are bordering on unacceptable, especially with ultrasound guidance when you can so, if you have good, now, yeah. ultrasound guiding skills with the needle, they take a lot of time to develop. You, it takes a lot of skill. But once you develop it, you can see those vascular structures with power Doppler on a very, with a well-adjusted machine perfectly, and you can guide a needle, you know, I and I guide a needle right at the C6 level using the anterior tubercle to, in most people, to guard that um, vertebral artery. And in some people, you have to be able to identify when that vertebral artery is running still medial to the tubercle at C6, which I see uh, it's cr about 10% of my patients have that. This is yeah. a much more common anomaly. So I, I would say a couple of things about radiation. Um, so with, with the C that we use nowadays, the radiation dose is actually a lot less than the fluoroscopy-based approach. And I've, I used to do a lot of frostbeak based cervical um, studies. I also do a lot of ultrasound guided approach as well. But I agree with you. I think ultrasound is probably a better way to do it than, uh, than CT. Uh, you know, but we, the reason why we do CT is because I suppose uh, a lot of radiologists here, uh, we can document it. You know, it it's, it's, and, and we can do the same ultrasound, but we have a lot of patients here who've got very big necks. And sometimes the image quality may not be the way you want it. So a lot of my colleagues are more um, comfortable with CT than ultrasound, although we are starting to change that a little bit as well. Um, so radiation dose, I think you'll be surprised now with the modern CT machines, the dose that we get from CT doing CT-based procedures are a lot less than fluoroscopy. Uh, and, that's, and, and, and I do quite a fair bit of fluoro as well, so we monitor the dose quite often. Um, and, and, and the other thing is that with ultrasound, I agree with you, I think you have to choose the modality. I do agree with you, I think. I mean, you were very modest in saying ultrasound is the same as fluoro. I completely disagree with you, with all due respect. I think ultrasound is far superior than fluoro. I think fluoro is by far the most dangerous method because you can't see a lot of structures. If you don't know what you're doing, you can go into the artery, it can cause all kinds of problems. So if I had to choose a modality, it will be ultrasound first, CT second. Yeah, and, I'm, and I say that, Colin, mostly because many physicians, what we want to do is get people safely doing these. Many physicians are qualified to do them under fluoroscopic guidance and not under ultrasound guidance. And if I had to have somebody who knew how to do it under fluoros, and, and you can mitigate some of those risks under fluoroscopy. I'm not a fan of fluoroscopy, but by using contrast, by using epinephrine in your injectate, by doing slow boluses, you can mitigate yeah. some of those risks. So it, it can be done. It's not my favorite way by far. Um, and then also just the real-time needle visualization as you're placing the needle is a big advantage of ultrasound. The, the other problem I think would be, the only time I would probably would say um, CT may have an advantage over ultrasound is if you have say scar tissue in the neck or something where the waves don't go through. But in general, I agree with you. I Don't get me wrong, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of ultrasound. I just <laughs> think that uh, 
you know, it's, it's, uh, uh, I was just more interested in discussing the technique because some people are starting to use CT rather than ultrasound. Uh, and, and I would say these furrows should not be used at all. I think the risk is far too high. Uh, and it's coming with somebody who used to do a lot of neck furrow procedures. And I thought to myself, I'm very lucky that I haven't got anything serious so far. But right. I've, you know, I've seen my colleagues uh, done all kinds of stuff and, and yeah, you know, all kinds of nasty things happen. Yeah, and Colin, I mean, look at you're talking to someone who lives in America. I mean, I'm used to using having to use like the veterinary and medicine transducers on these, you know, no neck people. But if you have a good machine and you have good skills, I think that you can safely do it even on, you know, extremely heavy BMI people. And I have, I've done it on people that I can't raise my table. They're so heavy, you know, cause they're past the, you know, they're, they're past the 200 kilo limit on the yeah. table. So, but it, it becomes harder. It's, it's more skilled procedure. And trust me, I wish that I had someone and some of those people, I wish I had someone I could send them to that had CT guidance because I don't really want to do them, but there's not really, I just have to kind of stand and fight. Oh, look, it's, uh, it, it's also part of the, the practice here in Australia. Is, it's also quite different from America, I, I guess, in terms of uh, what people are most comfortable with. Uh, like you say, uh, a lot of people are not as comfortable with ultrasound guarded injections. Um, for, for me, I have no choice because I, I do a lot of um, uh, neurotomies, frequency, radio frequency neurotomies and things like that. So ultrasound is by far the, the best modality, which is why I, I, I'm, I'm totally, I think I agree with you 100%. Uh, that ultrasound is by far superior, but I disagree with fluoro. I think it should not be used at all in this case. <laughs> I'd be fine never doing fluoro. I don't, I don't do it myself. I'm just trying not to, I'm trying to make this available to people. And sometimes that might be the only way. <laughs> Fair enough. Thanks, man. Okay. Thanks for a great talk, by the way. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that, Colin. We have one more question from Ramya Mahajan. Ramya, uh, would you like to uh, speak up? Uh, you have a question here in the chat room. Would you like to ask that directly to Dr. Uh, Shah? Okay, hello, go ahead. Hello. Yes. Um, yes. Hi, I how are you? Ask, uh, uh, what's the coordination of the uh, ECG coordination to the side of the block and what's the contraindication of the ECG coordination for the block? I'm sorry, R Ramya, you're, you're coming in broken. I'm, I'm not understanding your question. What the ECG, pre procedure ECG? Ramya? Hello? Hello? What's the role of Okay. Ramya, would you like me to read your question? Your yes, question yes. is, uh, what about pre-procedure ECG and uh, any contraindications to maybe a, a, an abnormal ECG? That's maybe what he's saying. Do you do oh, ECG? Uh, as just so you know, I, I do not do pre-procedure um, ECG. Uh, there is, because you have sympathetic chain on both sides of the neck, and when I say sympathetic chain, let me just admit, we don't know whether or not the changes we see are due to a vagus block or cervical sympathetic chain block, because they're quite close together. It's possible that this may be parasympathetically mediated. Sorry to spoil it with like the, the big thing that is, we think it's sympathetic, but we have as scientists, we have to accept that, hey, we're putting in a bolus of anesthetic. We may be blocking things that we don't think we're blocking. And one of them being vagus and 15%, up to 15% of the sympathetics run with the vagus. So I'm starting to include a vagus block at, at, on my way out from a stellate just to get the rest of the sympathetic fibers. But you have chains on both sides and I've done over 1,600, and although I've seen reports of stellates uh, potentially contributing to some kind of dysrhythmia, I have not really seen that. If somebody was in a very frail state, um, I would really consider doing any medical procedure on them, let alone a stellate. But I don't, I don't screen my patients beforehand with, with EKG or ECG. Question from Colin, go ahead, Colin. Oh, sorry again. Um, one more question. What are your thoughts on pulse RFA of the stellate ganglion? What do you think about it? Have you tried it? Uh, it's funny. I have Dr. Eugene Lipoff, who did publish a case report on that, coming to my office tomorrow to, uh, to go over some ultrasound guidance. He's trying to switch from fluoro to ultrasound guidance, so he's coming over to tomorrow to work with that. Actually, I'm having dinner with him tonight. 
he did one case report on that and and i don't think it ever was ever even published so he mentioned it he was kind of trying to make that work as a modality because everyone's trying to make pulse rfa work for something because we have the machine right so but uh but we and even then like the how the, the physiology of how pulsed RFA works is very hypothetical. At the end of the day, Colin, what I see is, and I've seen people purport using like rupivacaine with clonidine or rupivacaine with some dexamethasone to prolong the block. I've done over 1,600 cases of this exact thing and been following up on these patients and reporting on these patients. And what I see is I'm just using rupivacaine. I'm using 0.5% rupivacaine because I picked the safest profile, long at the anesthetic out there and publish on this heavily. And so we're seeing very good results. And I think that now what I'm looking more into is I call it doing the double, double. They come in one day and get a two level block on the right. And then the next day, a two level block on the left. And we're seeing, are we, are we capturing patients that would otherwise fail? Now, those patients are only done after we do either a one or two level block just on the right side. And if they didn't have sustained response, then we then we go okay. Let's let's try this. But it's um, I haven't seen this fail. And then I'd only consider pulsed RFA in a case. I mean, and maybe someday I'll look into that. But if somebody fails this, then should we do that? And then is pulsed RFA going to result in uh, more sustained uh, results? Now, the reason why. The main reason why I have a hard time doing pulse RFA is it is a lot of times I go and I stick that needle in and I'm going to a general area. I'm going to that kind of ventral end of longus coli and the fascia there because the, the I've seen and now I've done 10 of these dissections on cadavers where these sympathetics aren't in one chain. These sympathetics are running in multiple layers of longus coli or sometimes not even in longus coli, sometimes in the prevertebral yeah. fascia. Mostly they're in longus coli or the ventral fascia of longus coli. So your ability to, to every to accurately place a needle on what you're calling the sympathetic chain where you might use post RFA is questionable. I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm an authority on this and I can't always put my needle on the cervical sympathetic chain. And I know that there's like in Daniel Moore point out these multiple variants and how they run. So I think with a long acting local anesthetic, you kind of have a little bit of a hand grenade that you're dropping in there. Or a pulsed RFA, you're, it's much more precise. And I don't think that we can achieve that level of precision. I, I don't, what do you think about that? Um, yeah, I, 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 agree, I agree with you because I think one, it's one of the advantages and possibly disadvantages of pulsed RFA because the, the zone of um, ablation, uh, or so to speak, is quite small. You know, uh, the, the needles that we use to do pulse RFA or RFA in general has a very small ablation zone of less than a centimeter, sometimes even five millimeters. So you have yeah. to be uh, pretty much on the nerve itself or, or next to it. So if you were like, you know, more than a centimeter away, you're not gonna, you're not, you're not gonna hit it. Yeah, I you think know, it's a tall it's, order for the cervical sympathetic chain. Yeah. So I, I, I can see what you mean, and me, and maybe that's. Um, I mean, it's, 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 it's good and bad. It, it means there's a degree of safety. So you're not likely to get the, you know, the potential effect of, say, anesthetic going to where you want it to go. Um, you know, but on the other hand, you also want anesthetic to diffuse over those plex size. So when I do things like, say, not so much the, the aesthetic ganglion, but I do a lot of iloinguinal nerve, ilohypogastric nerves or groin pain, for example, things like that, or tussle tunnel nerves. And what I do is I target the, um, um, the nerves at um, several sites along, you know, not just one particular site. It doesn't take me very long to change the needle, uh, to position it at a couple of different sites, so I target a larger area. Um, but you're correct, uh, it, it does, um, I guess with a cellular gang, then perhaps you're correct uh, in the sense that you may not be getting as much as you would like compared to, say, just throwing a hand grenade or anesthetic into the the area there. Yeah, so I can see what you so mean. We see good results. I'm, I'm interested though. And if it's, you know, if I stop getting the results that I'm looking for, this would be an avenue of research. But I think that um, before I start pulse rfa in the anterior neck, I would, I would want to do it under protocol and I would want to, you know, publish those findings because I think that it's, it may not be benign. 
One of my colleagues in France, um, Dr. Kessler, I think he's doing quite a bit of past RFA in this. Uh, I'll have a chat to him and see what his results have been. But I think he's published one paper from memory, but I'll double check with him. Um, it'd be, it'd be, be interesting it. to see what the effects are. I mean, I, I, before I do RFA, I normally do just a simple block first anyway. So, you know, yeah. I, I wouldn't jump into it, but it's just an option, I guess, to consider, like you say, if the anesthetic didn't really work, uh, you know, or didn't work as long as you wanted to, whether you would consider doing a, a something that potentially could be longer lasting, maybe. Um, I'll talk to Dr. Dr. Lipoff about it tonight. Uh, I know he's done that, so. It's not that much more difficult from what you're doing with local anesthetic anyway, just a matter of placing the needle. No, okay. I agree. Okay. Uh, one last question, Dr. Shine from Apash. Uh, okay, Apash, go ahead. Hello, doctor. First of all, thank you so much for this lecture. It was really an eye opener for, for me. And I think that your work is really doing, you know, changing really the lives of some people uh, dramatically. And it's really great. I wish I could do this also sometime. Okay, so doctor, my question is, have you ever thought of doing this for other uh, psychiatric disorders other than post-traumatic stress disorders? I mean, if, if, if this is to decrease any of their symptoms, have, has anyone ever gone to you that's not post-traumatic and did it help? Thank you. Uh, so we do, the research is in post-traumatic stress injury. So I'm always very forthcoming with my patients, like, hey, this is what the research is in. We do routinely treat other anxiety states like generalized anxiety disorder, and we do see good results, but I kind of let them know, hey, this may or may not work, and then we'll just follow it. And because it wasn't part of a protocol, I just let them know, hey, we're, we see this work anecdotally, and a lot of times even like major depressive disorder has this strong thread of anxiety that runs through it. And I've treated p patients I almost never will write for like an SSRI. I've seen this one case was it was a woman whose baby was born premature. And so for three months, she was going to the neonatal intensive care unit, expecting her child to die every day. And then the child came home and the child was home for a few months. And this wasn't like postpartum depression, which can be very easily treated with progesterone if you recognize it. It is... Um, it was like, it looked like major depressive disorder, like Siggy caps right down the line, like everything. And I was like, holy cow, this is exactly major depressive disorder. But I, I said, I even wrote her for an SSRI. I'm like, here, I go, this is, a, you know, we should start treating this because it, you know, it can take like a month, six weeks to get to level. So let's start. I go, but would you be, you also may just be, have PTSD because this just might be have been really traumatic for you waiting for your baby to die and then your baby didn't die but you're still like scared like it's going to die so i did a block and she was better like not just kind of better she was all better i'm like don't fill the prescription <laughs> don't don't take it but it looks so much like it that i actually treated it I, I went to treat it so i think that there's this thread of anxiety that runs through it and then also we know as physicians that our patients only tell us what they want to tell us they don't tell us all their dark secrets just like just like you and me, we don't share everything with people. We keep things private that we don't want to share. Our patients do the same. And sometimes that's information that could have helped us take care of them, but they don't want to talk about how they're abused as children or how their spouse abuses them now or whatever, whatever they consider to be private. Um, so I think that this thread of anxiety is running in a lot of diagnoses. Now, I have people come to me who have... As long as they have uh, some kind of anxiety, you know, background or a background of PTSD, I have people who have bipolar disorder and PTSD. I have people that have schizophrenia and PTSD or schizoaffective disorder. And, and so I'll, I tell them, I go, look, I think I can help that PTSD and anxiety layer. I can't, this isn't a treatment for bipolar. You still need to be on your mood stabilizers or, or your, your schizophrenia. But we have people with mixed diagnosis. Just because you have a diagnosis of schizophrenia doesn't mean you couldn't have had a traumatic thing happen to you. So we still help those people with these mixed diagnoses, but I'm always very guarded. I'm always like, hey, this is not a treatment for that, but we may get some help. If you want to try it, I'm happy to do it. You know, I think it's a safe enough procedure in my hands that if they, if they want to try it, I'll be like, okay, and we'll, we'll keep track. And I have people with schizophrenia who are doing great. I'm not treating their schizophrenia, but I'm treating their anxiety that they had as a result of, you know, the, their downward drift in society. Does that answer your question? 
Yes, it does. Thank you so much. And I have one other question, if I'm allowed still. Sure, okay, so um, doctor, you said that um, if, if the patient doesn't respond, then you try the other side, right? So and my two questions are, what's the, the, the interval between trying another block? And when do you say that, okay, this is not good for you? This isn't working at all? Like how many times do you try it before you say, okay, I'm sorry if this isn't for you? No, actually, those are, those are great questions. And I have published a, um, basically a, a, a treatment you know, plan, a treatment uh, you know, algorithm, uh, and, and that is in publication. But generally what I do is if somebody lives in the local area within a couple of hours, then I'm like, hey, let's do the right side. And if their symptoms aren't that serious, they're not very serious, I generally do a one-level block. And if their symptoms are very serious, then I do a two-level block because I can't take a chance with them. We have, to, we have to see something happen. And then if they're local and they don't respond, so I track at their one-week score, and if they didn't really respond well, then I'm like, hey, come back and let's do the left side. Unfortunately, what I have now is a lot of people fly in to see me. Not unfortunate that they're flying in, but they fly in. And so they, the travel costs associated are really a lot of part, of part of their treatment and they don't have the time. So I have many people that come in and we treat the right side on one day and then the next day we treat the left side. And so now I'm stuck in a situation where I'm never going to have numbers that make sense to me. But we do say, hey, the next day we'll be like, hey, how are you feeling? And we'll have them fill out a PCL5 score. So we get a little something, but we are, the numbers are going to be muddy and we're not going to be able to really call that data usefully unless we have them separated by at least a week or two that we say, hey, look, this really didn't respond. And then with me, that's why I score the block, the score of the horners, because a lot of doctors will do a block and they won't record how dense was the block. And then you don't know what you got. You don't even know how to determine, well, was that a good block? So you didn't get better. I have people that have had four blocks and only two of them had any response in the eye done from another doctor, not by me. And nobody leaves my office without looking like the guy who's a mechanic at the auto shop could say, what's up with your eye? You know, that's uh, what I'm always going for. So first I score the block, good dense block. And then if they're not responding, even to like, even to two blocks, uh, I'll be like, hey, this doesn't seem to be have to do with the manipulation of your autonomic nervous system. So it's, that's one of these things that I really look at. Now, I do have people that, hey, they're doing better for a week, two weeks, and then they get re-triggered. Well, we're not curing PTSD. Um, excuse me. Sorry, I, like, I never have my allergies act up. And this morning, I'm like, what's going on? What's in here? But uh, I got every time I have exams, I get those rhinitis. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not, I mean, it's great talking with you guys. It's not, it's not anything like that. I don't know what it is. But um, so that's the protocol, really. I, if they, I have a good block, if they responded for a length of time and symptoms come back, then I at least every one of those data points matter because people can be re-triggered, especially if they had really bad symptoms. They're not very resilient and they can get re-triggered or especially... What if they're still living with the same abusive spouse? What if they're, they were a victim of sexual assault and then they have to get on a crowded subway and people are rubbing against them and that re-triggers them? So everyone has these, or maybe like it's like uh, the grandfather that beat them always used peppermint lifesavers. So whenever they smell that, they, they re-trigger. I mean, there's a million reasons why that they can kind of go back into it. What our hope is that I tell my patients about one third of my patients fall into the kind of one and done category where we treat them and they're even like Vietnam veterans and that have 50 years of symptoms are just done. And then the rest of people will need more than one over time. And that what we hope is that as time goes on, there's longer and longer intervals between them. But, and then it can be very dramatic. It can be they're doing fine for a year and then something re-triggers them and they feel their symptoms starting to go back. And I tell them, you don't have to wait till it gets bad. If this worked for you, just come back, you know, we'll do it again. It's safe to repeat. I just got uh, a little bit uh, intrigued because I was watching another Stellate block just to prepare for this like lecture. And then I saw that they wanted to do it over C7 just to eliminate the Horner's syndrome. So listening from your lecture, I was like, oh, so it's good to actually have the Horner's syndrome as like your, your um, check, check, like your checklist, right? If I did it right, right or not. You know, I, I, I kind of sometimes forget my audience and that a lot of 
pain physicians, they want to do it uh, lower because you get the Kuhn's fibers, the Kuhn's sympathetic fibers going to the arm because they're treating upper limb dysfunction and they want to see upper limb temperature change. I am not treating upper limbs. I am treating the brain and, the, and, the, and that brain body connection. So I do not care about what the upper limb is doing or what temperature it is at all. What I care about is, did the symptoms go up? Did we reach the brain? So we want a good dense horner. So there's nothing, people, their, their vision doesn't change. They're totally fine. It feels a little bit odd, maybe. They look a little odd for a few hours, you know, but there's no harm in it. So I don't know why it'd be something that they want to actively get rid of. And also, if you look at that C7, T1 area, that is tiger country. That is just big, great vessels, you know, taking turns that are difficult to, you know, ultrasound is only, it's a three-dimensional shaft of sound represented as two-dimensional image. We only think we know where our needle is. It's an approximation, even with a good machine. So I really, although I do work at that level, if I can get a benefit by doing it at C6, it's much safer. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Shan. It was so nice to have you tonight. And uh, I would say it's, a, it's really a breakthrough treatment. treatment. Uh, thank you very much for your interest. Um, if you have you know, further questions, uh, and, I'm, and actually, just so you know, if you could uh, get me this, I am looking, I get requests for stellate ganglion blocks from people from New Zealand, from Australia, from you know, different parts of the world. And I would really love to have someone that's doing this or, or providers that are doing this well and safely. If you could get me um, some Here? emails. My, my email is, you know, you have it, drshawn at rasm.org. No, I want but you to come here. Let Dr. me know from some of the people that are online who is doing this safely. And I don't care how they're doing it, as long as they're Dr. doing it Sean, safely. We would like you to come here after COVID. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would, I would love to come do some, you know, training in this. Because yeah, I think there's a lot of other methods involved in, in the, my experiences that I can share. Yes, to, yes. to really help a lot of people. But in the meantime, if, you, if there are people doing this well and safely that I can refer patients to, I, have, I get a lot of requests worldwide. Uh, Dr. Shan, we, we're going to post this. We have a YouTube, a Mass Cortisone YouTube channel. Can we post this lecture there? Sure. Yeah. Share it to other physicians. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, we really appreciate your time, your effort, and of course, sharing your expertise. Uh, this is to us really a breakthrough, as I've said, and I know a lot of doctors would benefit from this. And we would love to really uh, learn this technique from you and uh, in two ways, whether I will go to your place or you come to us here. So. Okay, it sounds great. It was really my pleasure and thank you very much. I'm honored to have been asked to speak to you guys. Uh, and you guys have a great day. I have to get ready to start clinic, so. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Sean. Right. God bless. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.